So we are moving to the last point on the program, uh, which is the wrap-up panel discussion about trends in AI. And I would like to welcome uh, and ask uh, Professor Vladimir Marik, the scientific director of uh, CIRC for this institute, to, uh, to, who is going to moderate the discussion. So I would like to ask him on stage. And also take the opportunity to thank him again for creating uh, such a wonderful environment here for science and applications also uh, downstairs. So, Professor Marik. Please. Thank you. I have this device. I would like to invite the panelists, you know, because there are six of them in the list. Uh, so I would kindly ask Patrick, Josef, Josef, Robert, Tomáš, and also Professor Holger. Who's? Please. Take a seat. Uh, so, I am glad that it was possible to bring so many experts, experts in one place at the same moment and they are ready to answer difficult questions I have prepared for them. I didn't warn them in advance, so I am looking forward to they will, how they would react. Uh, I don't need to introduce each of them because they presented today their research or yesterday, so it's not necessary to introduce. Now, first question number one. You are kings of the European Union, you have plenty of money, and you have to decide which three areas of fundamental research in AI you will fund. You know, just three areas which you feel are the most important for EU, for industry, healthcare, society, and we are talking about fundamental research, you know? So who wants to start, or should I simply start from one end and then from the other end? So I'll start from Tomáš. Okay, uh, so three areas. Well, I'm the first one, so I guess I will have the worst uh, worst ideas because I had uh, the least amount of time to think about it. But uh, I would say, in my view, if uh, we, would, uh, we would have really like this unlimited amount of money and we are the kings and everything, then uh, on the first place I would put uh, actually basic research because I think that uh, it's often overlooked. Uh, everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people now think that uh, things have been solved with deep learning, with new networks, we just need to have more computers, more GPUs, and we will solve everything. Uh, I don't think it's true. I think that there's uh, a lot of like fundamental problems that uh, current uh, machine learning doesn't solve. Uh, maybe we can develop some uh, new learning algorithms, maybe some new architectures uh, of these neural models, or maybe even different competition models than neural networks. Uh, but even like areas outside of machine learning, I, I think they are often overlooked, uh, they get uh, too little funding, and I think that uh, that is not a, not a good uh, thing to do. So number one would be really like basic research so that we build the uh, successful future. Uh, the number two, it was mentioned already like here, the healthcare. Uh, I think that uh, that is a super important topic that somehow uh, historically some it seems to uh, to me that it has been overlooked like uh, uh, during the COVID crisis I think that it was obvious that if we had uh, some uh, decision making supported by statistical models uh, that uh, the societies in my view would be much less vulnerable uh, towards uh, random decisions of uh, uh, people who are changing opinions here and there so again I think that healthcare uh, and uh, even investing into areas like prevention so that we would not even get ill but uh, that uh, we would uh, be uh, living uh, in a much more healthy way I think that would be uh, once it will happen and I'm sure that it will happen like maybe five years from now or ten years from now people will, will be amazed uh, by how far healthcare can be taken by statistical models the similar way as everybody is surprised now by by the chat GPT and well, maybe the third area, because I'm biased and I always uh, like this, uh, this research direction to build AGI around language models and so on. So I think that uh, that is an area that uh, now is super popular. Uh, I think there, are, there is still a lot of, uh, a lot of value, uh, but again, I'm biased. Uh, I, would, uh, I would invest in this uh, third area because I think that uh, it can still bring a lot of more, more value, even if it is not already like uh, the most visible part of, uh, of AI. 
Oh, thank you for your opinion. It was quite fair. What was interesting that you would support after COVID also research in the healthcare. Uh, the opinion of our Ministry of Industry is different. They stopped the uh, establishing of a research institute which should study uh, applications of AI, mathematics and other disciplines to solve such problems like uh, epidemic uh, disasters and whatever. With the explanation, COVID is over, it's not urgent, you know. So they have different opinion than you. But uh, I fully agree with your proposals. Uh, Josef. So I, I, I guess it's hard to disagree with Tomáš. Uh, I, I would say on top of the healthcare, it seems to me that AI can have a lot of applications in society, like in government, in, in the way how how we are um, like collaborating uh, with steering the society like there may be a lot of um, like al algorithms are today used or, or almost abused uh, like for example during the elections like there, there is like a very precise targ algorithmic targeting of, of the voters today but I and that that might not be necessarily <laughs> the, the the best thing uh, and like we, we have similar issues like with, with all these social media, etc. So, so I could imagine that we will start designing things that will be actually helpful for like the society to, to, to come together, to, to rule, to govern itself in a, in a better way. Uh, but I, I guess it relates to, to the healthcare a bit. And like maybe one more topic, I, I think mm, like no, I, I, I'm also quite excited about like the deep learning and language modeling, and I, I think the progress there is really nice. But but like my, my general criterion would be: um, is it good for science? Like if you if you can design AI systems that are doing science better and better, like better or at least as well as like, I don't know, mathematicians, physicists, biologists, doctors. Um, and, and we know we sort of can do it, right? Like there is this alpha fold, the, the, there is alpha zero, which beats humans in like Go. So, so the, the, there are signs that we can really design superhuman systems that are very good at uh, solving problems. Uh, so, so if we can do it, I, I think we will get an immense like boost, like the, there will be a, like a self, like a snowballing uh, thing that will help, help us to develop a, a lot of other stuff. So uh, in general, AI, AI for science, I think is like one of the things I would definitely fund. Thank you for your opinion. I think uh, to bring AI to public sphere and to governance of the state, means to educate the people and to tell them how to use it because there are already many tools which might be used but as the tools which support their decision making they cannot expect that we will bring complete solution and replace them and that if they misuse and that was uh, already mentioned in the first presentation today it's even worse than not to use AI at all so education uh, of the people in the government and local authorities and everywhere where you make decisions is quite important. Tools are here, we need to learn people how to use them. Agree with your opinion. Josef. So, there are excellent answers what we heard uh, before. I will add on top of this, you know, thinking, you know, from the perspective of the funders, I think it's a harder to think, you know, harder, harder choice. I will maybe add on top, on top of what was said one thing. I think it's very important, if this was the case, to have some quality control, to really, you know, fund things, you know, good science. And I think for this, the ERC program, I think, is a great example of something which, you know, is very well done. And if you, if, you know, when I talk with my US-based colleagues from the top universities, uh, they envy us two things in Europe. One of them is the compute resources, which I think we are a bit ahead in having. I mean, they are maybe not as good as in the big companies, but you know, it's better than what a 
you know, professor, even at one of the top uni U.S. universities, has access to by having these national infrastructures. But we have to really improve them even more. And the second thing which they, is a little bit sidetracked, but the second thing which they really envy us, and they say, we, you know, we, which is great, what you have in Europe is the ERC program. So I think having that for, have that all for AI, as Holger said, I think that would be wonderful. And I think there, what to fund there, I think the quality is important. We could, you know, one could, I think it's important to fund the basic tools, the basic research, because really AI, and I've sort of said this before, is like an engine which is going to power a lot of other disciplines, other fields in science. So I think we really want to understand that engine, develop that further. So I think we should have a program like that for, you know, developing, understanding that engine. But I think I would not shy away to have something like a synergy, like, you know, have really the en applying this engine in this cross-disciplinary areas uh, and you know that's where I'm also putting uh, some of my energies like with biology what I'm hearing from biology is there is you know potential for really revolution biology because of AI so I think you know this finding the you know understanding improving the engine but also cross-disciplinary things very important focus on quality that will be my answer thank you I appreciate your focus at quality because it's quite important you mentioned quality of research, quality of education, but I would like also to stress uh, the orientation towards quality of the AI systems, which should be verified, we should verify the limits, find the methods how to verify uh, the limits of the systems because misuse or if you use it, if we will use it beyond the borderline of expertise, uh, they will bring a lot of damages. So quality everywhere is your main, let's say, label. Now, uh, Holger, please. Well, you just said, I think, what, what I would consider the most important thing, uh, which is I would invest these resources to a large extent uh, into making AI systems that are better aware of their own limitations and capabilities and specific AI techniques that, that also help monitor uh, AI systems in general and, and warn us um, when they go wrong, right? There is, of course, research on this that, that already exists, very exciting research, but I think this is something that agrees very much with our values in Europe, right? Our engineering tradition that, you know, we want correct things, we want reliable things. So, so this is one area that I would invest in. The second area is um, systems that, or AI techniques that, that help us to actually build more efficient AI systems. So as you know, this is my area as well. So this is not me saying I want more money for myself, but I do think that everybody wins if, you know, things like automatic tuning, automatic configuration, automatic synthesis of AI system um, can be made broadly available. And, and the reason for that is that this, for example, in part could help us solve the AI sustainability problem, right? by making systems that get similar, that produce similar quality at lower compute cost, and, and that would be very valuable. Um, now, being forced to pick sort of a third thing, that, that, that's very difficult, right? I think Josef here did, did a great job in, in emphasizing the need for infrastructure and, and um, supporting talent. Um, I would want to do that too, for sure. Um, but I do think there is one area right now that I believe is really important for the future in terms of a topic area rather than a spending mechanism. And that, I have to say, is, is NLP, right? There have already been good investments, um, and there should be more, don't get me wrong, into machine learning, reasoning, and so on, and, and, and robotics as well. There should be more investments. But NLP is currently drastically lowering the barrier uh, to accessing and interacting with AI systems. And this is extremely powerful, right? And it's important for us to be able to compete there and also to do better than current NLP systems do, right? Do better in the sense that, that we want systems that, that can reason, right? That don't fall prey to the actually very interesting examples that we saw in the last presentation here, right? Um, so that is the third area that I would massively invest in because I think it changes the game not only because it's based on awesome machine learning, it most definitely is, right? But it changes the game because it drastically lowers the barrier to entry for interacting with and using AI systems. And getting this right is the basis for using AI responsibly, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, uh, 
it was quite clear what you said and consistent with your presentation. Uh, NLP is now on rising curve and it's important to finalize the development in this area in the way that the people will really be able to use it and to document usefulness of AI to the citizens who are taxpayers and who are bringing money back to continue in the research. And so it's quite important area. Yeah, thank you. Patrick. Okay, uh, three things. One which has already been mentioned here, and I think it's, I, I really want to emphasize it even more, which is uh, reliability and safety. Um, so I think it's one of the fundamental limitations of the current systems, and this prevents them from being really used in safety critical applications. Of course, I mentioned one in my presentation, but there are others, including health. Uh, I think, and I think it's a very open scientific question how to make these models uh, aware of their uncertainty or confidence, how to make sure that they are verified or, 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 or and safe at large. So I think it's it's very important, and it's very it's 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 both scientific question and very applied. The the second one is uh, to make sure that. Uh, AI becomes really a major tool for the people who are doing basic science on the uh, major challenges we have uh, for the humanity. Again, climate, energy, and health, and, and uh, having tools which are really for these people and that which need to be developed with the knowledge of these people and the knowledge of these sciences, I think it's very important. So I'm a really a strong believer in, in the um, uh, in the in the interface between machine learning and and basic sciences, and we don't need to rediscover. I mean, it's interesting to rediscover mechanics by by machine learning, but we know mechanics, so or the same with chemistry or biology, etc. So making sure that the, the, all these things are well uh, intertwined in order to get way stronger uh, tools in the hands of these scientists. The third one, which is a different note. Um, Recently, I have decided that I wouldn't sit in a panel if there is no women. Obviously, I failed. I'm here and there is no women on this, on this panel. Uh, and it's not to criticize at all, of course, but just to say that in terms of education, that, that's the other thing that we are lacking in, in many fields, and, but AI in particular and, and computer science at large, we lack diversity in, in, in terms of gender in particular. So uh, let's invest there. And I think it's a long-term investment to be made. Yes, that's, that's a quite clear mission or vision because uh, people will decide everything in the future and we need to enhance the university research and education. You mentioned also ethics, that's a very important issue and I think we are facing the problems of ethics more and more as the systems of AI are being developed. So very hot topics and uh, this linkage between let's say, machine learning and different disciplines. You need to learn people how to use the machine learning in the appropriate way. Thank you for your comments. Robert. I'd like to uh, uh, reinforce or emphasize one of the points that already has been mentioned, and that is uh, correctness by design or verification or whatever you'd like to call it. I was trained as a control engineer in, in control theory and these kind of disciplines, and you were one of my teachers. So, um, A great characteristic of that field is that you are trying to design systems in such a way that, at least on paper, they perform as desired, as required, and, and you do everything for also making sure that the eventual application or implementation is actually doing what is intended. And this is in a stark contrast to the current practice in AI and machine learning, where we use just lots of haphazard tuning of our hyperparameters and basically cross our fingers, hoping for that the system works. So I'd like to have much more research in sort of making current machine learning AI systems certifiable and verifiable. And the additional things that have not been mentioned are other structures than neural networks. I think we are now in the stage where, you know, after so many years of almost having banned neural networks as a, as a viable technique, we have overshot to using almost solely neural networks. 
And I think it's a kind of almost laziness. They, they work, right? So we have a common structure and we just put as many layers and billions of parameters. We train it and it works. But I think for a majority of real-world applications, there will be much simpler models that will do exactly the same job as the deep over-parameterized neural network. We just need to find them. So we don't know how they look like, we don't know how to train them, but I think if we do our best, we will find methods that are just better than, than deep networks, or at least as good, but maybe give us more power in analyzing their performance. And finally, I think currently there's a lot of emphasis on uh, supervised learning and on providing labeled data or semi-supervised learning where you're learning to predict, let's say, a missing word in a sentence, these kind of things. I think we should spend more research on unsupervised methods where this manual labeling, which is preventing many applications like autonomous driving, I think most of the problems are by actually failing to, to identify and label these edge cases in which these systems work. So it's an endless work. You just have to label more and more data. It doesn't seem to be like a viable way to, to getting a fully foolproof system. So we need to go after uh, preferably unsupervised methods that will sort of teach themselves. I, I know it's very hard, but that's where I would spend money. Thank you. You mentioned uh, as the first speaker here, also data and quality of data for unsupervised learning, because without quality of data and work with data, we cannot achieve uh, good results. What was interesting, then half or more of the panelists stressed the need for verification of the AI systems, uh, and uh, it seems to be a hot topic. Uh, second question to you, and I'll start from the other end. Uh, which technology of AI developed in the AI frame will influence the society in the forthcoming 10 years, in the forthcoming decade? Will it be GPT? Will it be machine learning? Will it be robotics, industrial robotics, or healthcare systems? where you can see strong impact on the society and what will be, uh, let's say, important for AI development in the future, to document with people that there is something useful, that it is something stable, which brings correct decisions and which replaced uh, people in decision-making. Robert, will start. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure if I understand the question correctly. You threw uh, many things in, in one bag, methods, techniques, and also application fields. I just mentioned uh, techniques. Yeah, yeah so uh, let me just make a random pick. So I, I think robotics, that's my field, and also I've, I've had a talk on that. So I think there's a lot of room for, uh, let's say, harvesting the results in the individual disciplines, like, like machine learning, AI, uh, control systems. If we manage to integrate these methods in a proper way and put them in operation on real robots, I think we can shift uh, the progress or we can bring it much further than where we are now. And I also embrace what was already mentioned, healthcare. I think there is an enormous space in, in healthcare for, again, using maybe even those methods that are available at the moment in a responsible way and giving uh, medical practitioners the right tools that they can sort of adjust to their, their ways of, of working and the, we can benefit a lot as a, as a society. So, so what's a short take. What you are saying is there are a lot of methods which should be in a reasonable way applied in the areas which are very important and this will bring the results and that's the way where to go. Exactly. Many of the tools are there already, maybe not exactly ready yet, but it's Many not. of them are ready already. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Patrick. Um, so, so things that are going to, to change our life in a very visible way, and it has already started. It, it's hard to, to ignore. If you, are, if you had asked me that uh, eight months ago, probably I wouldn't have, did I, I would have ignored that because I didn't know, but uh, I mean, th these language models, when you see in companies what is happening in the daily life, people just using these uh, uh, Copilot for code, uh, ChatGPT for text, etc., it is entering the, uh, the workplace. Um, uh, so it's changing the, the, the way people work in many, in many jobs. So, but 
but more importantly to me, I think that health, healthcare, from drug discovery to diagnosis and uh, imaging and, 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 and therapies, etc. I think here we can have something really big and very imp and really important with machine learning. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope we are really on the verge of seeing now the revolution starting there. Okay, so thank you. Healthcare is the, in the focus of your attention, and you are right. What we need more than to be healthy and to use technology to enhance the health. Yeah. Okay. So hard to agree, to disagree with anything you said. I mean, they're totally compelling points. So what can I say that's a little different from that? Notoriously difficult to predict what techniques will sort of be most important, right? I think most of us would have gotten that wrong the last few times around. So I'm, I'm not even going to try this, but at a general level, I think after we've learned to do amazing things, um, learning from large amounts of data, I think what will make a big difference is doing amazing things from very small amounts of data. And for that, I think we need new learning techniques, and I also think we need reasoning. And if we combine that in just the right way, we might not just be able to do amazing things with small amounts of data, for instance, in medicine, where we can talk about rare diseases, right? Or in uh, diagnosing complex technical systems, where we can talk about very rare fault conditions. Um, but we can also do it all in such a way that these systems become more predictable and more robust and, and, and basically uh, more reliable in the way that you, Robert, actually uh, emphasized quite nicely in the last round. So, so that's why I would see a lot of impact globally and especially a lot of opportunity for impact in Europe because, once again, this sort of agrees very much with our engineering prowess that, that we have in many European countries. So it's a good fit for us. Thank you. I also would like to... Uh highlight in your presentation the linkage uh, between machine learning and reasoning because reasoning can serve as a let's say glue or integration tool between different and among different smaller models of machine learning which might be used in this or other area so i think reasoning should be used in much more higher extent than up to now, linking the methods already existing, which are sometimes partial, sometimes bigger, but mainly partial, and reasoning might help to integrate them. Thank you. Josef. I will mention two areas, uh, and also because I have experience with, in them. Uh, one of them is robotics, as Robert said. I think there is an opportunity here. It's You'll also see there is also hardware involved, so we'll see how quickly that goes. But I, I you know, I, I think there is a lot of potential. And the second area I want to mention, already mentioned a little bit, but I think uh, it is, and people say health, uh, but I will go more specific, I think it's biology and chemistry. I think these are areas where really, and it's not just new drugs, we'll just develop, you know, new understanding. It's just the, you know, we see a lot of how much we get from scaling up the compute. Holger was showing the very nice uh, example, but, but, and I'm, you know, I'm sort of getting into that area, so, uh, so I'm not an expert, but seeing that what it allows you is like speeding up the processes which would take months to design. And I'm not even design like expert with new drugs and we are sort of new potential molecules and we are getting to a stage where we, you know, one can do these things in a matter of minutes. So it's really, I, I think it is, and what colleagues of mine are also saying, it is going to, it's likely going to be revolution biology and I think mean new drugs as outcomes, but also in chemistry and new materials. So we may really, you know, see revolutions in, in drugs and materials in 10, you know, I imagine in the next 10 years it may happen. I think for this country, I think there's a lot of potential because uh, we do have, you know, good machine learning, but I think there is a lot of uh, good, very good tennis. It's just across the street, uh, biology and chemistry, um, you know, very strong people. So I think, you know, there is a lot of potential to mine here from collaboration, I feel. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you think that AI needs a lot of data? And the data are in our biomedical, biochemical, uh, and I don't know which laboratories, and they should be used by AI to bring useful results. Am I right? Uh, and I think that it's okay. So there is a, 
it's the simulation. I think there is some data, of course, measurements, but I think the power where it's coming from, at least now, it's a combination of simulation on a molecular level and, and learning on top of that. So I think, and as, as a whole community, uh, and you know, this is not just one team, but I think once where I see the potential, we don't quite have, we are not on the level there that we would like gather the current powerful languages models are trained on almost the entire internet. So we are not quite there, but I think that the simulation is getting more powerful and we start accumulating data and would be able to learn from. I think that's where you know, we are start discovering the patterns in this data and you know, discover new things. So I think it's a com combination of simulation, learning, and then potentially verifying the hypothesis quickly in lab experiments, which maybe become automated or at least partially, or even in sort of existing, uh, you know, if it becomes available, clinical data. So I think that's where you know, it can come, uh, the breakthroughs will come. Thank you. Josef Urban. So, I, I, I probably said it in my talk, but maybe not so explicitly. So I once called it the semantic AI paradise. I, I gave a talk five years ago at the AGI conference that no, no one shall drive us from the semantic AI paradise. So I, I sort of see it coming. The, there will be a big merge between the symbolic methods and, and the statistical methods. The, the, the current statistical methods like, like the language models will very much help us to get there. So, so you, you can already see that the language models are getting pretty good in some symbolic task and people are pushing the boundaries and, and trying to see how far, far they can go with that. But what will happen will, will be ubiquitous transformation of what, what is today natural language, some disconnected databases, some, some pieces of knowledge flying out there on the internet into one coherent big thing. Like some people today think that the one coherent thing is chat GPT. Now you have seen McLeish's examples. The chat GPT is not a coherent thing, or at least in some senses. Uh, but there, there will be a way how to, or at least a gradual way, how to turn all, all this knowledge which is out there into um, like explainable uh, knowledge like programs that we will understand and that will be connected by, like probabilistically, by, by like, like, like these neural networks, uh, statistical models that will be capable to, to combine all these things. And that, that, that's already uh, happening very much. Like a, a lot of the current startups are about like using chat GPT to turn things like, like natural language input into some program, then running that program and doing something again, maybe something more statistical with that, and 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 like really like interleaving the, the, these things a lot. So so I, I think this this will really be like a major uh, event in that will happen in our lives. Like like all like for for me it's mathematics and physics and sciences, but I think it will happen very quickly in law also. Like basically. All of law will become logically expressed, and we will be running like, like very powerful mechanical lawyers that will be like combinations of, of, of the probabilistic and the symbolic methods. So, so that's one thing. And I think, uh, but, but maybe I'm stealing Tomás Thunder, uh, but I'll anyway say it. I, I, I think what, what will be also very interesting is to come up with the principles that are trying to come up with the development of intelligence from some, some very minimal, uh, like, like Kolmogorov complexity, Occam's razor, et cetera. Like just, we, we have discussed this a couple of times, like how do you create mathematics, for example? Like if you, if you should say what are just one or two principles that govern development of, of that, body of human knowledge of like, like mathematics, what would they be? And I, I think there will be progress in that. Like, like it again, like repeats, like people saying that we need to go unsupervised, right? Like th this, this is the, like, like we can absorb a lot of knowledge which is out there, but how, how have we actually created that? So, so that I think will be like a very interesting uh, technology 
development. Uh, I do have two additional questions. One of them, do you believe that the lawyers can be completely, could be completely replaced by reasoning systems equipped with huge volumes of, uh, I don't know, legal uh, documents? So, like, with this replacement, displacement, it's like, I, I, I guess job displacement, displacement happens, but like, uh, I, I think the argument, that the, there is a solid argument that whenever you create tools that increase human productivity, it, it doesn't really lead to unemployment. It, it's more like leads to development of more and more advanced fields in, in which humans are working. Like we, we will simply all be like very... Uh, enhanced uh, by, by all these technologies, we, we will be doing much more things. So, so, so the lawyers will, will also become much more enhanced. I, I don't know if they will be like fully, fully replaced, right? Like it's, it's like saying that scientists will disappear. No, they, they will just have much, much better tools, much more powerful tools allowing them to do science. So you mean that they will get tools which will enhance their efficiency, which will help them to make the decision but it will be, it would be, I think, like in medical area, that doctors will get some recommendations and they should make decision, final decision. This will be the same probably, according to my opinion. Yeah. In the, and the, the second question I, I do have is you mentioned that if we discover one or two principles, we can, we can make a big progress. You mean in addition to the principle we already know about the human life or uh, basic principles which are not discovered yet? And yeah, I, I, I meant, for, for example, no mathematician will give you today an answer what governed the development of mathematics. Like some will say that, that it's like our attempts to, to emulate, to, to simulate and predict the real world. But, but there, there are also many other criteria which makes mathematicians think about some areas of mathematics deeply. Like it can be physics that is not yet discovered, which, which happened in mathematics like, like several times. Uh, so it's, it's not clear to me and in general I think to mathematicians, like we, we have some theories how, how this could go, uh, how to just prime some AI, some autonomous system, which will develop something fairly similar to human mathematics from scratch, without any other principles, just from, let's say, one, two first principles. Thank you very much. And Tomáš, please. Uh, yeah, well, back, uh, back to the original question, like what, what could be uh, the things that will impact the, the society the most in the next 10 years, I would just... Uh, give the boring uh, answer as before. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be the healthcare and, uh, and it's uh, quite likely going to be the language models, uh, which were the areas that I was recommending to support uh, for the future, but to, uh, but to explain maybe more. Uh, the healthcare, I'm saying maybe, because uh, I think that uh, I keep predicting this already for the last five years. I'm not alone. I think that uh, on uh, most of the panels that I have been uh, in the last years, uh, most of the experts actually did agree on that healthcare is actually uh, the area where we have a lot of data. Uh, there's a huge amount of money. Uh, we as people would want this area to advance. And uh, it's basically obviously going to be much better uh, by using machine learning. At the same time, it's just not happening. And I, I don't think it's a technological issue. I think it's a social issue. It's, uh, that's why it's hard to predict when will it happen because uh, uh, we have like a, uh, the healthcare is organized mostly by state organization here. We have like the Ministry of Health, we have the, the insurance companies that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, keep uh, most of the money and then we have uh, then we have the hospitals and uh, and the doctors and just uh, making it all together. Basically, it's all these uh, all these uh, parts will communicate with each other and somehow uh, allow the like significant change of the system to happen. I think that is the real issue that uh, there would probably need 
to be or at least one person who would take it as uh, his lifetime project and really like uh, push it for years against all the resistance. And I don't really see that person at the moment. I think it's uh, it's needed. So healthcare, in my opinion, there's like a huge ways how to make it uh, better. I mentioned a lot of before prevention because uh, it's always uh, nice that we can dis uh, discover new drugs uh, by, by using machine learning. That's certainly true. But uh, I think that uh, it's, it would be even better for us, for people, if we would be able to avoid actually getting ill. Like I mentioned the COVID thing, and uh, there are many statistical patterns, uh, especially when there are new diseases, but uh, but uh, also like uh, that are different for different in individuals, like personalized uh, personalized health recommendations, that's something that machine learning can give us much better than whatever does exist today. And uh, uh, as I said before, I would repeat my prediction that uh, once we get machine learning into healthcare, people will be amazed how uh, good it can actually become and what it can do in a similar way, how many people are now uh, amazed by chat GPT and what language models can do. Uh, basically, it will be unbelievably unbelievable for many people how much better the healthcare will become and uh, I again I keep predicting that this is gonna happen soon uh, but uh, but uh, but uh, somehow somehow it's uh, it's still not happening so I, I hope that in the next 10 years we'll get there then I mentioned the language models as the area where I would like to invest I also see it as as the area that is very likely to change our society in a big way because it already is happening so I'm already not really like making a prediction but rather describing the the current situation, I still think that there are areas where uh, people will discover that uh, these language tools can be can be helpful. It can be helpful even for the scientists. Uh, I think it was mentioned many times on the panel that uh, we also need uh, this uh, this focus on the correctness and verification and ethics and so on. And uh, I think that maybe we can be a little bit weaker on these assumptions because uh, we can look at uh, different technologies that uh, did work and were never 100% correct there. For example, there is uh, Jan Shedivy sitting here who was uh, working all his life on speech recognition. Speech recognition never, never was 100% correct and uh, it was still good enough to be used. Uh, machine translation also like never was 100% correct, but uh, it's pretty good uh, to be used as long as, uh, as, as, uh, as the systems are good enough. There are areas where we don't really need to verify whether, whether everything is fine, but uh, for entertainment, for example, I think language models can be used in computer games totally fine and just because they generate sometimes some some nonsense uh, doesn't mean that we have to block their usage for for the next 10 years uh, so I think that I, I would have like weaker assumptions about like what, what we need uh, uh, for this technology to be used but uh, I also mentioned uh, this this other area as the first one actually where I would invest which was uh, the basic research and uh, I agree what uh, what was mentioned uh, just now that uh, that uh, these things uh, are already great, but they can be even better if we would uh, make some further advancements. Because uh, uh, honestly, uh, the neural language models as we have now, um, uh, as we have them now, uh, of course, like there's a lot of uh, scientific PR that tries to convince us that every two weeks there's a new language model that is radically better than than the previous ones. But uh, if you would be more realistic and look at really like the results and like uh, uh, numbers in say perplexity on some standard or benchmark marks then really we are not really making that many advancements it usually takes many years to move further when it comes to uh, some uh, some fundamental uh, like qualities of these models to generalize uh, uh, and I think that maybe we are like one or two more steps away from systems that would be like a uh, hundred times better when it comes to uh, their ability to for example store uh, memory for a longer time uh, to generalize uh, uh, to remember information so I'm kind of like hopeful because because there's so much excitement now about language models that uh, people will be working on this technology and maybe in the next 10 years uh, there will be again like some uh, significant change uh, so not just uh, more GPUs and, uh, and more training data but there are like some uh, some better ways maybe approaching the unsupervised learning that was already mentioned as well uh, maybe there are some some discoveries that are just ahead of us uh, that's always uh, hard to predict but maybe we'll get there and I think that this can be uh, super exciting technology even for the scientists because uh, there was uh, one of the original visions of how AGI can be accomplished and how uh, how uh, it can work as basically being uh, an assistant for scientists that was proposed by Ray Solomonov who was at the first meeting where, where the where the name itself artificial intelligence was actually developed so already back then like some 70 years ago people were thinking about some systems that will be helping scientists to go through a huge amount 
amounts of information so that uh, we can process uh, this information and, uh, and uh, become much more efficient scientists. So maybe that's, uh, that's 10 years ahead of us, maybe a bit longer, but uh, that's something that I think will uh, transform our society in a huge way. So, said Tomáš Mikolov, I think there is nothing to be added. Healthcare, better language models, and of course to enhance support everywhere where it's possible. And it's task for more than 10 years, I'm quite sure, but we need where to go. The target is here. So it was the best wrap up of this panel session. And uh, I think it's time to thank all of you for participation. So I would like to thank Robert Babushka, yeah. Patrick Perez, Holger Hoss, Josef Šivic, Josef Urban, and Tomáš Mikolov. Thank you very much for participation in this panel and in this symposium. Tomorrow we will continue with the third day. There will be an open day for public and uh, you can meet many people if you are still staying here and discuss with them what's uh, needed, what's possible and what's in the focus of interest. Thank you once more for the, your participation. Thank you.